Joanna Joyce. I'm a professor at the University of Lausanne. Um, I lead a cancer research lab here and we're focused on understanding interactions between cancer cells in the immune system. Um, I also co-founded Skills for Scientists uh, at UNIL with Slavica Messina um, and we're very motivated to um, arrange and organize different workshops and roundtables and networking events to really try and diversify skills for students and postdocs uh, in the Lausanne area in careers as diverse as academia, industry, communication. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested, excited to be part of the jury this year. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Lagier. I'm a scientist by training and I'm also an improviser. Uh, I've been doing public speaking trainings for scientists for a number, number of years now, and I have my own company, Sam Speak Science, dedicated to helping scientists, researchers, experts at large, uh, to convey through spoken words their expertise. And um, I knew, I've known about FameLag for a number of years. And uh, the first time I heard about it, I wanted to compete. And then I was very frustrated to realize that there was an age limit and I was just above the age limit. Um, and I've, um, I've been doing training sessions for FameLab. I've been uh, hosting a FameLab event a few years ago. And for the first time this year, I was asked to be part of the jury. And I was like, yes. Let's discover this other side of the competition. So I'm honored to be your judge for this round of uh, Fame Lab, Switzerland. Yeah, so hello, I'm Shaurdeep Majumdar. I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering at EPFL. Um, I, my research area is in molecular simulations where I deal with designing nanomaterials to capture CO2 molecules. I think FameLab and, and um, initiatives like this are so important for communicating science effectively to the general public and uh, I think it's a really key aspect of what we do as scientists. We have to be able to communicate in a clear and effective way what we're doing, why it's important, what we hope to discover. So I think, you know, uh, Fame Lab is, is such a great example to see enthusiastic young scientists doing that. So, so I love it. I'm, I'm happy to do it this year and uh, I'll be happy to do it, you know, for the next 20 years. <laughs> Therese is doing a PhD in virology at Schuf. She is prompted to share her passion for the topic with other people and Fame Lab is the perfect platform to do so. Greetings agents, the immune system has been breached. The culprit goes by the name of JZ virus, or JZV for short. But before I go into the details of the operation, first for some background information. Think of your immune system as a special police force. It is always on duty surveying your entire body for criminals or other pathogens that might be harmful. When it encounters such intruders, it has various ways of dealing with them, either by preventing them from entering our cells or by targeting and eliminating cells that are compromised. In this way, our immune system succeeds in preserving the peace and order in our entire body. Well, at least most of the time. This is where JZ virus comes in, a master of disguise, you can say, which in all its cleverness is able to completely evade the detection of the immune system and hide itself in the kidneys of 50% of the adult population. This means that one every two of you is most likely harboring this dangerous criminal without even knowing it. But don't panic yet. Our immune system is very efficient in doing its job and it will keep JZ virus in check the moment it tries to cause trouble. It's only in a very small group of people whose immune systems isn't functioning well at all that the virus is able to execute its master, master plan of destruction which do, is to escape to the headquarters of the body where it hacks the cells that play an important role in signal transduction between neurons. And in this way, it is able to shut down the brain control of the entire body. So now you can see how a harmless guess 
can transform into a life-threatening creature and affected individuals are often left with severe brain damage and in some cases even death. So how do we counteract this? Well, we know from the art of war that it is necessary to know your enemy. But in the case of JC virus, this is not as easy as it seems, since JC virus has a very peculiar affinity for brain cells, and especially those that come from humans. So unless you want to donate your cells to study this elusive creature, we will need to rely on alternative strategies. And thanks to the innovation of some smart scientists, we are able to create decoy cells in which we can trick JC virus into thinking it's its target cell, and in this way reveal how it's able to infect this cell cells in the brain and overcome their built-in def defense mechanism. So finally, we are one step closer to devising counter strategies against JZV and maybe one day stop it from ever executing its master plan of destruction. Thank you. Renar did his PhD in Moscow and then moved to Lausanne for a postdoc at EPFL. He feels it's our duty as scientific community to dedicate time for public outreach. He hopes that by sharing passion and enthusiasm for the scientific approach, we can make the world better. Hi, I'm a physicist, so please let me start with quoting a number. Uh, there are around 100 trillion particles called neutrinos passing from your, from, through your body every second. That's right. Every second, 100 million million elementary particles. At night, they pass through the entire Earth before reaching you. Don't worry, they won't make any harm, uh, since they almost do not interact with atoms of your body. Uh, they, pa they pass cosmic distances without noticing anything. So what if I told you that particles with, uh, whose interactions are even weaker, much weaker, a billion times weaker than those of neutrinos, could be responsible for the origin of matter in the universe, the matter which we are made of? Uh, but first things first, the, th the theory of elementary particles is the theory of building blocks of our world. This, uh, the predictions of this theory have been tested with enormous accuracy. Yet, if we combine this theory with our understanding of the universe at the largest scale, we come to the conclusion that uh, there should be no matter, only light and neutrinos. But we are here. Well, also, uh, the theory tells us that the neutrinos should be massless. In 2015, the Nobel Prize had been given for the, for the experimental discovery confirming that neutrinos have tiny masses. Could these shortcomings be related? Yes, if one assumes that there exist heavy partners of neutrinos. This option is actually even uh, aesthetically uh, nice because uh, all other matter species come in pairs and neutrinos are lonely, so the partners would fit the gap. What about the origin of matter? A long time ago, long before the first stars were born, the heavy partners were decaying to anti-neutrinos a tiny bit more efficiently than to neutrinos. The symmetry allowed the matter to survive and form the nice and interesting universe we know. This mechanism is called uh, leptogenesis. So, there could exist particles with interactions which are even uh, weaker than those of elusive neutrinos. One can say, well, this is pure theory. However, at present time, there are experiments which are being developed. Some of them will be located not far from here at CERN. These planned experiments will be able to catch the heavy neutrinos, of course, if they exist. If this will happen, there will be, an, there, there will be evidence of the earliest time in history when the universe was 10 to minus 11 seconds old. That's it. Thank you very much. Melanie is a PhD student in immunology and cancer at University of Lausanne. She decided to enter FameLab because she realizes how much it's important to communicate science, but also how much complicated it is. So she would like to be able to explain to family and friends what she's doing and why it's so important. You see my cutie little protein? Well, she has a problem. She's misfolding. So, what will happen to her then? So first, the cell will try to repair it, but sometimes it's not possible. And in that case, then the cell needs to degrade this protein. And for that, she needs a recycling machinery. And cells, they have a very powerful recycling machinery, 
which is a protein complex called the proteasome. So basically, what the cell will do first is that they will mark the protein with even smaller proteins that are called ubiquitin. So here you see a multiple ubiquitin that form a chain. This chain will be recognized as the proteasome. And when the proteasome recognizes the protein, then it will change its conformation in order to leave the protein enter inside. And inside the proteasome, the protein will be degraded into many small peptides. And those small peptides, they can be reused by the cells in order to build brand new protein like this. How sounds it? And you know what is very cool with the proteasome also? Is that it's a very good target for cancer therapy. So let me explain why. So, so some cancer cells, like cancer cells derived from immune cells, like plasma cells, they produce a lot of protein. And what is happening when they produce a lot of protein, like antibody, is that they do a lot of mistakes. And then they need to have proteasome in order to recycle those misfolding protein. So what is happening when I block the proteasome with proteasome inhibitor is that I accumulate the misfolding protein outside. And then this accumulation, it will stress the cells, like a lot. And when a cell is too stressed, then she will die. And it's like this that we can kill get some type of cancer cells. Awesome, isn't it? But you know, cancer cells they are very smart. So what can happen sometimes is that cancer cells they become resistant to proteasome inhibitor. And when you reach that point, it's very difficult to get rid of them. So what I do in my lab and what some other labs are doing is that we try to identify partner of the proteasome. And then we want to target those partners with the proteasome. And like this, we would like to kill the cancer cell before they reach the level of resistance. And like that, we hope that at some point we will get smarter than the cancer cells. Thank you. Adele is from Madagascar. She's a pharmacist and she's doing a PhD in pharmaceutical technology. She's also passionate about musical theater and public speaking. And she's always wanted to incorporate these aspects to her scientific background. Fame Lab is an opportunity to see where she stands and to push her boundaries. What is the similarity between coral reefs and the human gut? Well, both of them are complex ecosystems that are composed of a huge diversity of uh, beautiful colonies. Our own coral reef is called the microbiota. I'm sure you've heard of all of those microorganisms that live in our body. Yeah, you know, fungi, viruses, archaea, and bacteria. Yes, these organisms are our roommates. In this talk, I will mostly talk about the gut microbiota. Did you know that there is a hundred trillion bacteria in our gut only? Yes, and that amounts to more than a thousand species and it makes about two kilograms in weight. Incredible, right? But why do we have to cohabit with bacteria? Don't they cause deadly diseases? Well, I'm glad you asked. They help us against pathogens. They form a physical barrier. They can compete for nutrients and they could also secrete antibacterial metabolites, which is pretty neat, right? But there's more to it. Our microbiota also help us with our metabolism. They help us with our vitamin needs. Also, they can help us with the health of our intestinal cells. And finally, also for our anti-inflammatory response. So, I'm sure you've heard of these advertisements for probiotics that helps you with pills, skincare, or even yogurt, right? Mind you, that studies have shown that a disruption of a healthy gut microbiota, which is called a dysbiosis, can lead to diseases such as Clostridioides difficile infection, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, or even colorectal cancer. Even more surprising than that are diseases such as autism spectrum disorders, obesity, diabetes, or even Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Can you believe it? 
This means that the composition of your microbiota can make you either skinny or obese, or depressed and happy. Wow, I'm so fascinated. This means that bacteria can not only be humanity's greatest enemy because of infection, but could also be humanity's greatest weapon against diseases. They say that beauty comes from within, and this could not be more true. Thank you. Lena is a PhD student in neuroscience, and she would like to do her research a favor, learn to present it with passion and confidence to make it shine. Pain is an excellent sensory system designed for your safety. Like a fire alarm that detects smoke in a burning building, pain sensing nerves called nociceptors activate in response to potential or actual damage to your body. However, for some people, this warning system malfunctions and a false alarm is triggered. The alarm is really loud disproportionately to the pain. A soft touch and a little bit of heat can become excruciating. A staggering 10% of the common population suffers from neuropathic pain. Many of these people develop it due to nerve injury caused by trauma or surgeries. Chronic pain persists long after the wounds have been healed and it is notoriously difficult to treat with medication. So how can we turn off this false alarm? In a collaborative project, we show a proof of concept for a non-pharmaceutical treatment. We use a light emitting implant that will go around the damaged nerve to silence pain signals. But you'll tell me, how does light prevent pain? Indeed, it doesn't. So we rely on a light-sensitive protein called an opsin. It is designed to uh, stop the, activate, the activity of nerve cells. To test the implant, we use genetically modified mice that express this inhibitory opsin in nociceptors. In this way, when the mice feel pain, the light of the implant silences the nociceptors. When the implant is on, the mice have an increased tolerance to heat, and they, we also tested their sensitivity to mechanical pressure using thin filaments that resemble needles. The light, the light decreases the sensitivity to painful pricks, but did not change their response to normal stimulation. This pain selectivity is important because we want to keep other tactile sensations intact. The use of this implant is promising, but it won't work in human patients without that opsin present. So we deliver the gene of the inhibitory implant into the nerve. We did this in normal mice and showed that the protein is functional. In the next steps, we hope to show that this strategy is effective in mouse model of neuropathic pain. We want to turn down the volume of this disproportionate pain and silence the false alarms. This type of treatment can lead to a brighter future for many patients. Hugo is a PhD student in IPFL in statistical physics applied to artificial intelligence. He hopes to gain further insight and experience about effective communication through FameLab, as well as professional opportunities to pursue a career in the field of science communication. An artificial intelligence, or AI, is an algorithm that can learn basically anything, play video games, drive cars, recognize animals from photos. How does it learn all this? Data. Big data. An AI learns by analyzing data sets of, for example, photos. The more photos it analyzes, better it learns. But that's a hitch, because the more photos an AI has to analyze, the more time it will take and the more computer power it needs. So, on the one hand, you'd like to give your AI only a small number of photos, so as to save time and save computing power. But, on the other hand, you don't want your AI to learn less well because you only show it a small number of photos. What a dilemma. Can we do something about it? Yes, we can. And to give you an idea of what, let us play a role-playing game. I'll be the data scientist, and you play the role of the AI. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to distinguish kangaroos from wallabies. That's a typical task in data science. I have here a data set of four photos. I show each photo, tell you whether it's a kangaroo or a wallaby, so that you can learn what each of them looks like and eventually learn to tell them apart. 
ready. And this is a kangaroo. This is a wallaby. Without that photo help you in your learning process? No, it's a tiny silhouette in the background far away, so this photo, this date, is pretty much useless for you. Next photo is again a wallaby. This, on the other hand, is some very useful data. You can see exactly how a wallaby is built, that it is shorter, rounder, cuter than a kangaroo. Last photo, another kangaroo, again, blurry photo, useless. So, out of the four photos I had in my data set, how many were actually useful for your learning process? Only two. And I've not shown you the other two photos, well, you'd have learned just as well. This is true for any data set in data science. Only a fraction of the photos in the data set is actually useful for the AI. In practice, researchers in computer science employ a branch of mathematics called information theory to find out which photos in the data set are useful and which are useless. Once useless photos have been identified, they can be thrown away. This way, the AI will have less data to analyze. Therefore, it will use less time and less computing power. What's more, since the photos we threw away were useless anyway, the quality of the learning will remain pretty good. Because it's really as people say. Learning is all about quality, not quantity. Thank you. Alexander is from Bulgaria and is doing a master degree in computer science at EPFL. The topic he's going to present is not his field of expertise, but rather a side interest of his. And he would like to share it in an understandable and approachable way to a broader audience. String theory, theory of relativity, quantum physics. If this was an accurate description of your brain's reaction to complex physics theories, you're definitely not alone. Of course, if something is trying to explain everything in the world, we should allow for some complexity. The thing is that despite these complexities, many of the theories do not really explain the whole universe. One theory might explain this part of our world, and another that. But as soon as we try to merge them together, things do not always fit well. So here is an natural question. Is it even possible that there is one underlying concept which unifies all of these theories? This is exactly what Wolfram Project is trying to create, the fundamental theory of physics. This theory starts with something very small and basic, and by simple transformations, one step at a time, it evolves it into our whole universe. In the heart of this theory is something called a hypergraph, which really is just a fancy version of a graph. So let's think about this for a second. You can think of a graph as a network, a network of entities, and different connections between those entities. Take, for instance, Facebook. Facebook accounts are our entities, and the friendships between different accounts is what actually connects them. And next, we can think of various rules how we can transform this graph over time. Let's take a very simple example of a Facebook graph with a single entity. And a rule that says, for every existing Facebook account, we add two new ones, representing the two best friends of our initial Facebook account. So we can see that after applying this simple rule just a few times, our graph quickly, quickly evolves from a simple thing to a much more complex one. So why is this graph so important? Just like two hydrogen and one oxygen atom bound together, form the water molecule and define all of its properties, such as color and taste, our abstract atoms connect to form different regions of interest. Regions which exhibit various properties of our universe. This concept, together with various mathematical tools, we can make general statements about things that correspond to different stuff like quantum physics and general relativity. Things that have been already proven to be true. And this shows that we might actually be on the path to finding the common origin of all the current physics knowledge. And maybe even more, take a step further and shed some light into the yet unknown part of our universe. Thank you. Emily is a PhD student in neuroscience at the University of Geneva. She's going to talk about her PhD thesis in neuroimaging, in particular, how our own emotions affect our perception and understanding of other people around us. 
when you fall in love, high on a cloud of passion? Have you ever felt that your emotions could be shared, even without speaking? Once this cloud disappears, the real landscape shows its ups and downs, or at least in my marriage. Has the fear of each other's reactions ever led you to misunderstandings and heartbreaks? Can our own emotions actually distort the way we perceive each other's timid smiles, feel each other's emotions, or even sense each other's physical pain? Three questions, three experiments for my PhD in neuroscience. In all three, I induced emotions in participants by showing them one minute of joyful, neutral, or fearful movie clips. In experiment one, I presented pictures of faces with neutral expressions. I found that participants induced with joy or fear interpreted neutral faces as more joyful or fearful. So our emotions can distort how we see people. In experiment two, I further confirmed these results in the case of actual situations. When participants were induced with fear, Reading a story about a character in a joyful situation was not enough to feel the character's joy. And conversely, when induced with joy for fearful situations, using magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, I measured this suppression of feeling directly in the brain activities. So our emotions could switch off empathy for emotions in others. In experiment three, I presented pictures of injured hands. When participants were induced with fear, they could not sense physical pain in others. Again, using MRI, I saw that fear suppressed the related brain activities. So our emotions can switch off empathy for pain in others. Fortunately, although participants may not feel emotions or pain in others, they could still use their reason to understand them. Moreover, one minute of joyful or neutral movie clips could switch back on empathy for pain in the brain. These results transform my relationships. This is how. First, I speak. I don't assume the others feel my emotions and needs based on my facial expression or on my situation. Second, when I need comfort from someone we laugh and connect before I reveal my suffering. Next time your relationship passes into a storm, I encourage you to speak and laugh for the sake of peace and love. Leah is a PhD student in environmental science at University of Lausanne. As a statistician, it's her daily challenge to explain what she's doing to people around her and she considers it a personal goal to share her enthusiasm for statistics with others. Moreover, FameLab is a great chance to work on her own presentation skills. If you ask me, it is a real pity that gossip is this rare these days. All the more I want to tell you a rumor that I heard from my friend Peter, a wine grower. He told me that he actually found a wine that makes the drinker more charming. Imagine that, just take a sip and no one can resist your charm, neither at a job interview nor on a first date. Peter's wine became a bestseller immediately and he wants to produce more. But there is a problem. He wrote down every step in the production process, but not how often he stirred the barrel before he matured the wine. And that has a high impact on the charm causing properties of the resulting wine. As wine is made in a rather complex process, it is difficult to conclude from the finished wine to the number of stirs in use. So what should Peter do? He's a clever guy, so he's going to use a method called Bayesian inversion. Peter can remember that he stirred between 10 and 50 times, so he has some a priori knowledge. Then he has some leftover bottles of wine in his cellar, that's his data. He now wants to combine those two to gain some so-called a posteriori knowledge. Therefore, he starts to produce wine with a number of stirs between 10 and 50. Then he compares the resulting wine with the sample he has. If the wine is similar, he saves the number of stirs, and otherwise he does not save the number. Then he chooses another number of stirs and does the same. 
After repeating this procedure many times, he gets a big stock of safe stirring numbers. To illustrate this stock, he makes a plot where you can see which number of stirs was saved how often. The resulting plot look like camel humps. The peak of the camel humps are located at the number of stirs that were saved the most often, what was at 15 at 40 stirs for Peter's case. So both of these numbers seem to lead to the wine that makes the drinker more charming. Now, lucky Peter has the choice that he can stir 15 or 40 times, depending if he's in a sporty mood or not. Additionally, this Camelham plot gives him a good knowledge about the uncertainty of his estimates. If the humps are narrow, then he must pay close attention to how often he stirs, because only the exact number has led to the desired wine. However, if the humps are wide, then it does not matter if he stirs one time more or one time less. So thanks to Bayesian inversion, Peter not only found the good number of stirrings, but he also found out if he can have some glasses of wine himself before he's doing the stirring, or if he shouldn't. So let's have a toast to Peter, who found in Vino Veritas and who makes the world a more charming place. Cheers. Samuel is a master's student in robotics and believes he can communicate and connect well with people. He'd love to engage the audience with the legend of dragons and provide an engineering recipe to the design of one's personal mighty dragon. Dragons. They've been portrayed in all shapes and colors, but I bet that if I ask you to tell me what a dragon looks like, we could all agree on something like this without forgetting the ability to breathe fire. Rather than this imaginary version, I'd like to examine with you the natural kingdom to find traces of what dragons would truly be like if they existed. The feature I don't want to give up the most is the ability to fly. Let's focus on that. It might seem obvious, but our dragon, in order to fly, needs to have large wings and it can't weigh too much. Let's try to quantify this together. The heaviest living flying bird on Earth is the Great Buster and it can weigh up to 20 kilos. Honestly, I can't imagine a dragon going on a diet, so we definitely need to do better. Luckily, we know, thanks to paleontology, that the skies of modern Argentina were home to the Argentavis magnificence, the largest bird to ever take to the air. It was a fearsome predator, weighing around 70 kilos and about the same size of a light aircraft. This sounds better to our dragon, who's not a fan of losing weight. But if we, if we put also not birds, we can even go further. Indeed, the largest animal ever discovered belongs to the Pterosauria order. Some members could weigh up to 200 kilograms and have a wingspan, which is the distance between the two wingtips, even greater than 10 meters. Now, how could these massive creatures fly? It's still debated. However, they were probably too large to take off from the ground autonomously, as well as like sustained flopping flight. We are missing here the cost associated to flying. Indeed, moving large wings up and down is extremely demanding, and it requires a constant supply of energy, which their flight muscles were probably incapable to provide. The lift required mainly depends on the wing loading, which is the ratio between the weight and the wing surface, as well as speed. Given that we cannot increase excessively the wing shape, we need to play with the speed, and our dragon needs to find, it needs to find a way to increase its velocity without excessively flapping. Again, let's look at nature. Uh, Broad-winged birds typically use winds and thermals to soar and cover large distances with minimum fatigue. Given that these uh, strong winds mainly, uh, mainly originates in certain environments, dragons will probably be confined to certain areas of the world only. I think we can all be happy. Our reverie about flying dragons is restored and kids can dream again about their ex existence. Francisca works in a small company as a scientific communicator. She loves when science is explained in a fun and interesting way so that everyone can understand. She thinks it's important to communicate scientific findings so that people get more aware of themselves and what is around them. Hello and welcome to the secret life of RNA. Just recently, RNA became famous with the development of the new RNA vaccines um, against the coronavirus. But what is RNA? RNA is short for ribonucleic acid and I call her the little sister of DNA. Um, DNA is um, uh, sorry, uh, the, um, generating the proteins or uh, the hard copy of the proteins. And for a long time, 
Scientists thought that RNA has the same and only job to also code for the proteins. But uh, after some time, um, scientists found out that she has a lot more hobbies. One of her favorite hobbies is acting. She loves to act the characters um, of her favorite movies. One of her favorite movies is Wally. She uh, really can do these little robots and uh, um, Prote uh, uh, robots and uh, little machines really well. Um, and when she does that, she calls herself a ride design. Uh, one of her other really favorite movie is uh, The Gladiator, uh, especially the character of the Roman Emperor. So she loves to reenact his decisions, um, and what she does is to uh, decide about the fate of the genes, whether they are being translated into proteins or being silenced. Um, uh, just not so long ago, uh, scientists found other uh, very interesting, cool things that she does. Uh, uh, one of which is she likes to um, modify her appearance by what I call RNA tattoos. These RNA tattoos, why she does that is not really clear yet. Um, completely, probably she's in a rubble phase, uh, but there must be more behind it. Um, they found that, uh, so the researchers found um, that some of these RNA tattoos can ha help her have even more power over the protein production in the cell. Other um, RNA tattoos uh, help her to become more stable and resistant in life. By the way, um, in the new RNA vaccine against the coronavirus, there's also tattoo or tattooed RNA. Again, this makes her more stable to safely come into our cells, and once she, she safely reached our self, uh, cells, um, she finally does her real job uh, coding for proteins, and uh, our body then makes antibodies against this to prepare us for the real uh, attack of the virus. So finally, RNA can step out of the big shadow of her big sister and gain the respect that she deserves. Hazil okay. is from Kashmir and is pursuing a master thesis in microengineering. Since he's working in the micrometer regime, he would like to speak about the size and dimensions of COVID-19 that he believes most people have no idea about. He says something very important. In FameLab, you either win or learn. You never lose. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Fasal Bashir. I come from India. Back in my bachelor's, I studied vast mountains, about oceans, about beaches, about uh, the deserts, and all the things in geology. And unfortunately, it has been a year since we have been to those beautiful places and locations. And suddenly, after some uh, point of time in my bachelor's, I got interested into things at very small scale level and things that are accurate extremely fast. I'm talking about things in the microelectronics regime. And there is one more thing in the same microelectronics regime that has made us to be in the lockdown for the past one year. Yes, I am talking about COVID-19. As for the people who study viruses called virologists, they say when a person is a peak of his infection in a person who is sick due to this COVID virus, he has about 1 billion to 100 billion COVID-19 viruses inside his body at the peak of the infection and due to the extremely small size of these viruses the total mass of all the 10, 1 billion to 100 billion viruses in the body it's just 1 microgram to 0.1 milligram and if we want to put these things into perspective how much does a microgram or 1 milligram look like it should be oh this is way more than this this is exactly the amount of viruses inside a body of a person who is at peak of the infection. And when we multiply these viruses, the total number of viruses inside a person to the total number of people who have been infected by this virus on the planet Earth, that's around 125 million as of this day, we see the total mass of all the viruses. It is just 0.1 kg to 10 kgs, that's at max. So you see, for the whole the destruction that this virus has caused, it's just 100 grams to only 10 kgs. So the next time we go outside, we want to remove our mask, we do not want to use hand sanitizers, just 
to ask yourself a simple question okay the virus is not there i am not seeing it oh it's so insignificant i cannot even feel it but just ask yourself a simple question does size really matter the answer is no the size does not matter no matter how small the virus may seem no small how in no matter how insignificant it looks to us it is still there it is still dangerous and one more thing if we have a virus inside but we have a strong immunity we may act as potential carriers we go infect a person who has who has sicknesses who is of older age and we may transmit virus to him so the next time you go outside just make sure whenever you want to break any rules that have been set up whenever you go outside and you want to remove a mask you want to touch unnecessary things you want to go to a place that's crowded unnecessarily just ask yourself a simple question does size really matter the answer is no size does not matter virus is still there and it is still very dangerous thank you If you're anything like me, you were hoping and praying that with the release of the COVID restrictions, there would come the opening of the cafes. And you were sorely disappointed. Because man, I just want a great cappuccino. None of that machine-made trash. But that, of course, begs the question, what makes a great cappuccino? And more importantly, how can I make a great one at home? So for that, Let's look at the cappuccino. The cappuccino is made of two different parts, the espresso and the foamed milk. The espresso is delicious, but it requires complex machines and is a conversation for another time. But foamed milk, that's easy. That's something we can master at home. So what is foamed milk? Foamed milk is milk that has tiny air bubbles trapped inside of it. And to make foamed milk, you need four things, gas, liquid, surfactants, and energy. Now, I just want to talk about surfactants today because I think they're really interesting. When gas and liquid come together, at their interface, there's surface tension. And to overcome the surface tension, you can use surfactants. In milk, these surfactants are already present. They're called proteins. And these proteins are interesting because they've got different parts to them. One side of them hates water. It's the hydrophobic part. But one of them loves it, the hydrophilic part. And they're both there on the protein, just like two sides of the same coin. And when milk is cold, these proteins are all entangled in itself, like this big ball of yarn. But when you heat milk up, these proteins untangle themselves and stretch out, ready to encapsulate something new. And this is what we want. We want them to encapsulate this gas bubble. And when they do, with their hydrophobic side facing the gas and the hydrophilic side facing the water, they, remove, they overcome the surface tension and they're able to stabilize these bubbles. So what does that mean? More surfactants means more stable bubbles. More proteins, more stable bubbles. So to make more stable foam, we need more of those. And this, this is where skimmed milk powder comes in. Skimmed milk powder is uh, is just a collection of whey protein called beta-lactoglobulin. And when you add this to the milk and then foam it, then you are able to create bubbles that last longer. Not the silly large ones that go away as soon as you bring the cup to your lips. And that's my secret. 5% of skimmed milk powder to your milk right before you foam it. Then you're well on your way to bubbles that are stable, thick and a foam that is creamy and that's going to help you get through this spring season without a cafe. That's what it's going to do for me at least. Thank you. I was looking for, I was looking for passion. I like to have people really talking from, from the heart, really feeling their engagement, engagement, their their love for their topic that's that's one clear aspect the other aspect is of course uh clarity of the science and and rigor in the science that is that is presented 
firstly i realized how <laughs> difficult it is to be on the other side and judge <laughs> and choose participants so that was one experience i had this time so yeah in this way i was happy to be back with fem lab and um, i was looking for like um, like uh, like being a part of fem lab one thing we get to know is this 3c thing so i was looking forward to a nice combination of these 3c's a nice chemical mix of these nice uh, 3c's so um, specifically like something where i was looking forward to uh, to find some nice scientific content which is presented in a way which captures my imagination and which makes me think about it and go back and search more about it so this is what i was uh, keeping in consideration when i was um, picking my so top four candidates I, I personally was looking for uh, clear presentations, obviously interesting content, uh, confident presentations, but in a natural and unforced way. And for me, probably the most important thing I was looking for, in addition to all of these things, um, was uh, what were the presenters that were able to really convincingly convey their love and enthusiasm for science. I think that that was that was really key. The, and it, it's a hard thing to quantify as scientists, of course, um, but the 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 ones that that I picked as as the the top choices, they all conveyed that very clearly, in my opinion.